क्वेश्चन इज विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज मोस्ट कॉमनली इंजर्ड स्ट्रक्चर ड्यूरिंग लैरेंगोस्कोपी सो दे आर आस्किंग अ कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ मोस्ट कॉमनली इंजर्ड स्ट्रक्चर ड्यूरिंग लैरेंगोस्कोपी एंड द करेक्ट आंसर टू दिस क्वेश्चन इज अपर सेंट्रल इंसाइजर अपर सेंट्रल इंसाइजर सो लेट्स सी लिटिल विड अबाउट लैरेंगोस्कोप्स सो लैरेंगोस्कोप इज अ डिवाइस बाय विच वी परफॉर्म डायरेक्ट लैरेंगोस्कोपी which is used for endotracheal intubation okay now there are multiple types of laryngoscopes which are present but based on the shape of blade we have two basic types of laryngoscope macintosh blade which is a straight blade laryngoscope this is the most common used laryngoscopic blade and this is used for adult intubations while this is a straight blade laryngoscope i'm, I'm sorry macintosh is a curved blade laryngoscope it is a curved blade laryngoscope while miller is a straight blade laryngoscope i'm sorry i have written it wrong it's a curved blade Macintosh is a curved blade laryngoscope while Miller is a straight blade laryngoscope and this straight blade laryngoscope is used for pediatric intubations this is used for pediatric intubations okay so this is based on the type of laryngoscope now very practical questions that come from laryngoscopy is how do you hold the laryngoscope so you always hold the laryngoscope in left hand remember not in non dominant hand but in left hand because it's a left handed laryngoscope you can see the channel through which you can intubate the patient is facing towards right so it's a left handed laryngoscope right then you insert it through right angle of mouth insert it through right angle of mouth so you hold the laryngoscope in left hand you insert it through the right angle of mouth and the most commonly injured structure is what we just saw is upper central incisor that is tooth is the most most common injured structure in that upper central incisor okay so this was about a question on complication of laryngoscopy all right <clears throat> question number 2 identify the capnogram shown below right so now what you can see is that the capnographic waveform is sequentially increasing the capnography is increasing that means it is hypercapnia right hypercapnia and we know hypercapnia most commonly occurs with hypoventilation hypoventilation but hypercapnia also occurs with rebreathing so then why rebreathing is not the answer because you can see the graph is touching the baseline that means there is no inspiratory co2 when the graph doesn't touch the baseline then it will be rebreathing okay so the correct answer to this is hypoventilation now let me give you a clinical approach to capnography this is something i have made so that the questions on capnography become very easy so whenever you get a capnographic waveform or, or a clinical question on capnography then you have to first look whether it is hypocapnia or hyper now for hypo or hypercapnia normal et co2 is 32 to 45 mmhg so if it is less than 30 it is hypocapnia more than 45 it is hypercapnia now when there is hypocapnia see whether it is gradual or sudden like in this there is a gradual hypercapnia right so it can be gradual or sudden if it is gradual but it is decreasing but not going to zero it is because of hyperventilation or hypotension right but if it is eventually going to zero that means it is esophageal intubation it is esophageal 
intubation why because in esophagus there is no source of co2 so eventually the co2 is gonna die out so when it is gradually going to zero then it is esophageal intubation while if it is gradually decreasing it is hyperventilation or hypotension what if this hypocapnia happens suddenly if it is happening in the sitting position surgery then the most common problem is venous air embolism then the most common problem is venous air embolism but if it is suddenly going to zero that means it is cardiac arrest or disconnection it is cardiac arrest or disconnection right now let's come to hypercapnia hypercapnia again gradual or sudden if it is gradual then see whether the graph is touching the baseline or not if it is touching the baseline it is hypoventilation so there is accumulation of co2 but if it is not touching the baseline that means that is rebreathing of inspired co2 rebreathing of inspired co2 similarly if hypercapnia happens suddenly and you see it intraoperatively then malignant hyperthermia which is actually the first sign of mh sudden and abrupt rise of etco2 but if it is happening while you are performing cpr then it tells you about return of spontaneous circulation that means resuscitation was successful resuscitation was successful right so this is how you have to approach capnography okay so the correct answer here is hypoventilation by first it is hypercapnia then it is gradual and gradual hypercapnia where graph is touching the baseline tells you it is hypoventilation okay now the next question which of the following is the least appropriate technique for induction of anesthesia for a newborn for surgical repair of tef tracheoesophageal fistula so there is a fistula between trachea and esophagus right so there is a fistula between trachea and esophagus so now this is a condition where there is inherently increased risk of aspiration right there is an increased risk of aspiration let's see what are the options awake tracheal intubation inhalational induction with spontaneous ventilation and tracheal intubation inhalational induction with ppv and bag mask ventilation rapid iv induction and tracheal intubation right so the question that asked is asking least appropriate now we know that because there is a fistula between the trachea and the esophagus so if we do a positive pressure ventilation then the air will go into the stomach and it will inflate the stomach increasing the risk of aspiration furthermore so the correct answer here is inhalational induction using ppv and bag mask induction would would not be such a good option but yes awake tracheal intubation you can always perform right you can you can do it by fiber optic bronchoscopy fob inhalational induction with spontaneous ventilation and tracheal intubation again a very good option and rapid iv induction and tracheal intubation which is also called as rsi is a perfect option right so what you don't want to do here is you don't want to do positive pressure ventilation ppb all right now question number 4 fade in response to tetanic stimulus is seen in fade in response to tetanic stimulus is seen in so we know fade as a response is a feature of ndmr and we know phase 2 blockade of succinylcholine mimics the ndmr so the correct answer here is d right now what is fade fade is when on repeated stimulations you see decrease in the response that is called as fade and fade is a characteristic feature of ndmr type of blocks and phase 2 block of scolene mimics the ndmr blocks so it is also seen in phase 2 block of scolene right this is because of the uh, competitive inhibition uh, competitive antagonism of 
uh, acetylcholine receptors by NDMR. Right? Now here is a summary of muscular responses to nerve stimulation with different types of block. So you can see that there is a phase 1 block, phase 2 block and NDMR. You will see all the features of phase 2 and NDMR are same. So on single twitch there will be decreased of course in all three of them so that is common on tetanic stimulation there is decrease in height but no fade but yes fade seen with ndmr and phase 2 post tetanic facilitation seen with ndmr phase 2 train of 4 fade with ndmr phase 2 train of 4 is less than 0.4 less than 0.7 and here it is more than 0.7 and anticholinesterase administration will enhance the block of phase 1, antagonize phase 2 and NDMR. Okay, so this is a summary of muscular response to nerve stimulation with different types of blockade. Okay. Now, fifth question this is an easy one. Adrenal suppression is seen when we all know reversible adrenal suppression is a unique feature of etomidate where it causes adrenocortical suppression by inhibition of conversion of cholesterol to cortisol by inhibiting the enzyme 11 beta hydroxylase eleven beta hydroxylase okay there is a temporary adrenocortical suppression the clinical significance of this is unclear but yes because of this, we do not prefer the use of etomidate in ICU for prolonged sedation and, and because it can cause adrenal insufficiency, right? Here, corticosteroids are administered in stress dose that is 100 mg per day. So, adrenal suppression is seen with etomidate. Now, question number 6. A 35-year-old patient with history of grand mal seizures is anesthetized for thyroid surgery under GA consisting of medas propofol infusion, remifentanil for analgesia. So this is a TIVA based anesthesia, right? Total intravenous anesthesia. The patient takes phenytoin for control of seizures. After surgery, the patient is transported, intubated into the recovery room where he is arousable but not breathing. The most reasonable course of action is, so not breathing means apnea or respiratory depression. And let's see, which are the drugs here that will cause respiratory depression so will midazolam cause respiratory depression yes will propofol cause yes will remifentanil cause yes will phenytoin cause no so now the culprit is midaz propofol and remifentanil now if the patient is arousable that means the effect of propofol has subsided because propofol anyway has a very very short duration of action less than 10 minutes right so when you switch off the uh, propofol infusion then within 10 minutes the patient is awake right he is arousable so that means there is some action of the drug but not breathing so it can be either remifentanil or midazolam now a unique thing about remifentanil is that it has a very short duration of action even after an infusion, the duration of action is less than 6 minutes, which is even lesser than propofol. So, it is very unlikely that remifentanil will be the reason for apnea. So, the reason for apnea would be midazolam, right? Because it is a benzodiazepine and benzodiazepines are known for their respiratory depression. So, now that we have come to the reason for respiratory depression, let's see the options. Administer naloxone, flumazenil, both naloxone, flumazenil, ventilate by hand. So the obvious choice for us would be to give flumazenil, which is a specific benzodiazepine receptor antagonist, right? No. Why? Because of a very important history of grand mal seizure on phenytoin. Now, when you reverse the effect of midazolam, which also has an anticonvulsant effect, When you reverse it using a specific antagonist, then it will also reverse the anticonvulsant effect and the patient can land up with grand mal seizures. So the best course of action here would be to ventilate the patient by hand till the patient starts breathing on his own, right? The reason is because it can precipitate seizures in epileptiform patients, okay? So it can precipitate seizures 
in epileptic form patients use of flumas and why because it also reverses the cns depression the uh, cns depressant effect of the <coughs> midazolam or benzodiazepine okay each of the following results in reduction of incidence of post operative vomiting in children undergoing strabismus surgery except adequate hydration dexamethasone ondansetron and anticholinergics okay so out of this the correct answer is anticholinergics which have not shown to decrease the incidence of post operative nausea vomiting now pnv is a very notorious and a common side effect of anesthesia and for understanding PONV we have to see the apfel criteria which are the risk factors for PONV which are female gender non smoker history of PONV or motion sickness and use of opioids or nitrous oxide this is the apfel criteria which are the risk factors for pnv right now there are certain high risk surgeries for pnv the most offending are middle ear surgeries middle ear surgeries strabismus surgery abdominal surgeries right so this is a strabismus surgery where there is high risk of pnv so we can give dexamethasone on dentsentron and drugs and adequate hydration has always shown to improve the incidence of pnv okay what is not important is anticholinergics okay last question which of the following is true regarding intravenous regional anesthesia true regarding intravenous regional anesthesia which is byers block so let's see the options useful for post operative pain in extremity surgery can be used for extremity surgeries lasting 2 to 3 hours bupivacaine is drug of choice for prolonged blocks and lidocaine is most used so let's first understand what is intravenous regional anesthesia so ivra or intravenous regional anesthesia or byers block is a simple technique to perform and it is usually done for upper extremity in the extremity that has to be blocked you take a iv line okay then you exsanguinate that limb using a schmack bandage and then you inflate the tourniquet above the systolic pressure above 2 to 2.5 times above the systolic pressure and then you inject la in that limb so for that particular surgery there is a short action of the local anesthetic in that particular arm now because tourniquets cannot be inflated for more than 60 to 90 minutes therefore you cannot do long procedures with ivra right now the anesthetic agent of choice the local anesthetic of choice is the one with highest margin of safety why because when you release the tourniquet all the local anesthetic will diffuse into systemic circulation so the first choice is prelocane but in most of the countries prelocane is not available as a drug so the second choice becomes lignocaine now because of this bupivacaine is actually not recommended for byers block because it can lead to cvs toxicity because bupivacaine is most cardiotoxic local anesthetic so the correct answer here is bupivacaine is the uh, sorry lignocaine is the most common used because the question is true so lignocaine is most common used right so this is about buyers block